Now, Ira Berlin, a very fine scholar at the University of Maryland, in one of his books makes the distinction, actually he borrows this from uh, Moses Finley who wrote about ancient slavery, it doesn't matter, the distinction between a slave society and a society with slaves. Okay? Most slavery in world history has been in society with slaves. A society with slaves is, a, is one where slaves are a fairly small part of the population and slavery, although important, is not the central institution of economic production. So, for example, the, the northern colonies, we'll talk about them in a minute, New York, New Jersey, etc., were in the colonial era were societies with slaves. There was plenty of slavery, but it was fairly small scale, fairly low in number compared to the plantation areas. In fact, Berlin says only three slave societies have existed in world history. The southern United States, the Caribbean, and Brazil, maybe Cuba in the 19th century too. But in other words, these are places where slavery is the foundation of the economy, the foundation of the social order, where slaves are a majority or near, nearly of the population, and um, where the presence of slaves is the key economic, political, and social factor in those societies. Um, those societies, slavery is much more brutal, much more heavily disciplined, policed, and much, more hard, much harder to get out of. Pathways from slavery to freedom are far more restricted in slave society. And the United States, the American South, was the most closed of any slave society. Ac avenues to freedom, access to freedom, was more difficult for most of American history in, in this country than in almost any other slave society. And also racist ideology, which we'll talk about in a minute, was probably, although present in all slave societies, at least in the Western Hemisphere, there was no slave society in the Western Hemisphere that did not produce an ideology of racism in order to justify the enslavement of African people. But racism was most intense in the United States for reasons we will maybe want to see in a minute. So although, uh, like Davis, we could talk about the whole Western Hemisphere, let's hone in on the area that will become the United States, which is what our main concern is here. By the time of the settlement of the British colonies, uh, uh, you know, the British colonies of the east coast of, the, of, of, of North America, Virginia, and then the other ones, um, plantation slavery had already entrenched itself. We're talking, you know, Virginia's 1607, Slavery was already a thriving institution by then in the Caribbean and parts of Spanish uh, America. Um, why? What was sl slavery then was based on sugar. Sugar was the great slave crop of the Caribbean and Brazil. The first mass marketed commodity in history. Before the sugar plantation, international trade was basically in luxury goods. I mean, what was Columbus looking for anyway when he went to, stumbled on the New World, right? He was trying to get over, he thought he was heading for China, India, the islands. What was he looking for? Spices, right? We said, hey, spices, silks, what, what's a big, it's a long way to go for a little oregano, you know? <laughs> but. Um, Spices were part of, were a luxury item. You could sell them for an enormous amount of money if you could get them back to Europe. But sugar is different. Sugar is a mass marketed thing and it, it became the greatest commodity in history up to that point. And the profits of growing and selling sugar were immense. You know, you can, as, as I don't know, as Henry Ford figured out and many other people, you can make a lot more money selling a lot of something for a low price than selling a few things for a high price. And sugar is so, and sugar requires slaves. They, you could not get free people to work on the, the very, very arduous labor conditions on these sugar plantations. But at the same time, the other great commodity of trade was slaves themselves. 
the slave trade itself. So basically international trade, or at least Atlantic trade, in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries is basically either slaves or the product of slave labor. That's what is being transported back and forth across the Atlantic. And the slave trade, control of the slave trade, becomes a major diplomatic prize in the contest for power of European empires. It becomes a cause of wars between Great Britain, the Dutch, and Spain. The Sugar Islands, today, you know, you're not going to read much about them unless you go to the travel section, you know, Barbados, the Leeward Islands, Jamaica. This was the core of the British Empire. That's where the money came from, those islands. The French, too. Saint-Domingue, Haiti, was the greatest little piece of the most profitable place in the whole French Empire. After the, after the, war, the, the Seven Years' War, or what we call here the French and Indian War in 1763, when the French had been whipped by the British, and the peace treaty was figured out, and the British had conquered a lot of French places, and they gave the French the opportunity to take back, to have back either Canada or Guadeloupe. Guadeloupe, tiny little sugar island. The French said, hey, give me Guadeloupe any day now. Who wants Canada? Just a lot of cold air up there. They'd rather have Guadeloupe than Canada, because that's where the money was in the 18th century. And in fact, the northern United States, from the British point of view, the colonies of the northern United States, as it become, New York, Pennsylvania, basically existed to send food to the Caribbean islands. That's what we did. We sent food down there to feed the slaves, because it was so, sugar was so profitable that it didn't make any sense to grow food. Every inch of land had to be used for sugar, and we'll bring the food from somewhere else.